And once again, welcome back to Hoopsville, everybody. Hope you're having a good evening. Again, we are pre-recording this. If you have not gotten that sense or you're just maybe uh, jumping to this part of the show, um, we are not live on a Thursday night, the first Thursday of the official basketball season. Uh, for, for many reasons, we have scheduled conflicts. We're also getting ready for the Hoopsville Classic, which you obviously heard more about. We'll talk about that uh, when we wrap things up in case you missed any of the information at the beginning. Um, so anyway, uh, we will be back on the air live the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Obviously, we go two weeks here. Uh, I couldn't get away with doing a show on Thanksgiving. I'm pretty sure, well, some of you might get away with what, listening to the show, so I applaud you for that, but I'm not going to get away with being able to do a show on Thanksgiving. So we'll be back on the air the first Thursday of December. We'll be on the air for a couple weeks in December before taking another break for the holidays, and then we come in and get back into the full swing of things with our Sunday through Thursday shows. Again, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern is the usual time frame that we sometimes go into overtime. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at D3 Hoopsville, and we really encourage you to use the hashtag Hoopsville. Please feel free to use that uh, as much as possible. Uh, also, Facebook.com slash Hoopsville, and emails at Hoopsville at D3Hoops.com. Uh, always glad to interact with you guys, both on the air or off the air. Of course, if you have any ideas of teams or even student-athletes or coaches we should talk to, we're always welcome to recommendations, um, and feel free to send them along. Don't forget our player, the, our school of the week will be starting up soon as well. We'll even start a new segment, we hope, in the new season, possibly called Cheers and Jeers. More on that down the road. We were talking women's basketball before the break, talking to two D1 transfers who are now playing in Division Three. Uh, Lauren Avant at Rhodes, who did that, uh, made that move a few years ago, and then Sydney Moss at Thomas More, who just made that move. We're going to stay in women's basketball for a short bit and join or have a uh, join us uh, our, our good friend Gordon Mann, deputy managing editor for D3Hoops.com. Gordon, as always, welcome to Hoopsville, of course, for the first time this season. Well, wow, good to talk to you, with you, Dave, and glad to be uh, back in season. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll have to admit, it, while last season was certainly long, it was a rare opportunity that the three of us, you, Pat, and I, could be at the same Final Fours twice, uh, essentially going to the championship in men's. It was a long season, so I welcomed the break, but at some point in this, over the summer, I kind of went, okay, I'm ready to get back at it, in, including in football. So it's uh, nice to get things uh, tipped off, as it were. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm usually ready by about uh, mid June. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, uh, you've got to wait a while longer than that. But uh, I'm, I'm 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 glad to be uh, glad to be back in in season, even if there's two of them going on uh, yeah. for most of us right now. Exactly. Uh, keeping it all straight can be a little bit challenging. Uh, every once in a while, I've even tweeted from the wrong account. Um, let's talk women's basketball. First and foremost, number one team in the country, DePaul, off to uh, uh, still a pretty good start for them. Um, you know, two and zero. When you and I are talking again, this is taped. Beating Otterbein handily and then uh, getting past Franklin by eleven. They play uh, Milliken on the weekend at center. Interesting. I you know I talked to their head coach uh, over the weekend or, or last uh, show, I should say. They're starting the season three straight weekends with three straight um, tournaments. Not your prototypical schedule, but um, maybe as number one team and the defending champs, nothing's prototypical. Yeah, and I I, th I think what Coach Hoffman is aware of is she's aware that once she gets into conference play, there's going to be a lot of nights where the Tigers aren't really challenged by their conference opponents. There are uh, probably one or two teams in the North Coast Athletic Conference, which is the conference they're in now, that can give them a full uh, you know a solid game, a full game. Uh, Kenyon's been okay on occasion. Uh, you know, Wittenberg has been okay on occasion. Wittenberg is the team that played them best last year. Right. But there's going to be a lot of nights when they're, you know, when they're they're playing Hiram and, and and programs like that that just really aren't at their level. And Coach Hoffman knows that. So her chance to get the Tigers ready for March, where you know, a long way to go, but where I'm sure she expects them to be playing, is in the non-conference season. And, and the NCAC is also a big conference. So there's a lot yeah. of conference games. So, you know, the, she's got a chance in her first six games to play five NCAA tournament teams and maybe Illinois Wesleyan, who's, you know, a national champion from two years ago. So Otterbein and Franklin were NCAA tournament teams. If they play center, that's an NCAA tournament team. Uh, and then they've got either Washington U or Illinois Wesleyan. Yep. Uh, you know, so they, they, they're – as they've done in the past, they've, they've, they're going to challenge themselves uh, out of conference here uh, before they get into the bulk of their their conference play, and it's uh, you know it's smart because they return a lot. 
Uh, Alex Gassaway is a preseason All-American. She's back. Savannah Trees, a, a good outside shooter. And I think the thing we noticed about them last year um, was their they, their strength was was really in their depth. And while you know, Gassaway is a good individual player, um, they didn't lose a lot when they brought the second unit onto the floor. So there's there's really no reason to expect that you know if they get through if they get through their first six games. One that'll be pretty impressive, but two, you know, they may, may be looking at another twenty-five and zero regular season heading into the NCAA tournament, and they haven't they haven't lost a regular season game now in a long, long time. Yeah, no, it, it, that's the amazing thing is they could they could just go on a streak here. The NCAC <laughs> clearly thrilled that the DePaul women's basketball team entered their conference, um, but it, it, in the long run, it could make that conference much better. We've seen some teams there improve already. A um, little quirk that I saw coming out of here, and, and if there's other things obviously jump on here. Obviously, we've had some upsets already. We saw St. Thomas women's basketball team lose, uh, among some others that have lost. What I found fascinating is Hope, uh, preseason number nine, playing Calvin, who's outside the top 25. I saw that score, and my first thought, honestly, was, okay, men's basketball. Then my second thought was, oh, oh, this is one of those scenarios where they're both at the same term and they ended up playing each other. But no. They played a conference game on November 19th. I just I, we've seen this more and more from conferences moving up conference games into the into the first week of the regular season, which is a whole nother conversation in itself. But wow, I did not expect to see, you know, I, I wasn't paying attention, I guess, to see that Calvin and Hope were going to play a game on November 19th. And in that game, by the way, Hope had her rally scoring 59 points in the second half just to win it. Yeah, I, I had the same reaction. I like you. I when I first saw the matchup, I assumed they were playing at you know Cornerstone or Aquinas yeah. or Grace Bible or one of these other you know one of these other non NCAA teams that they they play within the region. Um, yeah, so hope you know I, I had, had the lead was that you know the season's five games five games old last and and hope may have already cleared their biggest hurdle to win the conference regular season championship now. You know, Coach, Coach Morehouse will print that out and set it on fire because he certainly doesn't want his, his kids to think that you know, ah, we're you know, five days in, we've we've got it all wrapped up. But, right. but the reality is, these two teams have won every title, regular season and tournament, yeah. since 2006. And if you go back farther than that, um, with the exception of a couple of individual seasons for Albion, they're really it for that for that conference. So it's it's not unrealistic to say, even with Calvin having graduated. You know, Division Three Player of the Year, Chris Burkeik, and Hope having graduated some really good players, that they're likely to be at the top of that again this year. And and Hope uh, in the win over Calvin um, did not get off to a good start. They were down eighteen to three five yeah. minutes into the game on the road. Uh, but if you, if you look at the box score, it's like Calvin got off to a really good start and then and then sort of fell off. And you know, from a Hope perspective. You know Coach Morehouse is a great coach and a great recruiter, and he does a, a really good job with the program there. And you look at the names of the kids in the box score. You know, Maura McAfee was, is a sophomore who I'm not sure if she played a lot of minutes, but they have a significant junior varsity program, so I would assume that's where she played a lot of her time sure. last year. They have a freshman who scored 18 points. They have a junior that whose name I wasn't familiar with who had scored 18 points. So. Um, you know they're very deep and 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 very good, uh, as always. And you know if, if I'm Coach Ross and I'm looking at this, who's got a relatively young team and has had you know some significant turnover of his own from last year, I'm probably looking at the schedule and going, you know, I'd really like if I, if I have to play Hope early, I'd rather play them in their gym so that at least if if I have to get a tiebreaker, I could give my team a chance to sort of gel and then come back and play them in February, as opposed to having my best shot to beat them when maybe I'm, you know, my my team's not quite ready for that challenge. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that that's there were other early conference games, uh, you know, the ASC, which has, which has travel limitations opened up because they've got teams that got to drive 14 hours to get the conference games. Yeah. They played some of them. Some of the really big New England conferences, like the New Mac, started uh, uh, started tonight. But yeah, uh, yeah that's that's a that's a really early conference game uh, and a big win. And they'll play each other again uh, in February, but that will be at Hope at that point. Right. And uh, you know, obviously, 
almost the whole way to go, more than just a long way. But that's that's a really big win for for Hope out of the box. Of course, the MIA is similar to the Centennial Conference, where you have that all women's school that uh, that uh, that unbalances everything. Uh, St. Mary's is on the women's side where they aren't on the men's where, you know, you have uh, Bryn Mawr on the Centennial side. That's another story uh, on the Centennial side that unbalances everything. But it's just wacky on the 19th. Yeah, Centennial started their games to this uh, on this evening that you and I are talking about. You know, I'm seeing it earlier and earlier. Uh, it's something I'm not a fan of. I think conference commissioners ha- have not figured out that they can actually make this work. But again, another conversation. I think they're they're uh, what they're doing, in my opinion, is and, and quickly is I think they're ruining the opportunity for these tournaments at the beginning of the season that a lot of these teams try and go play by putting themselves in the first week to ten days of the season. Um, I remember when we didn't have uh, conference games until um, after Thanksgiving. But then again, we also had conferences that were smaller. But I digress. Interestingly enough, Hope Calvin men will not play until January 11th. Yeah. And yeah, yet- and that's, that, that's the other. It, 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 I think you're right, and the, the St. Mary's throws it off. And, you know, I, I think for those, for those, those women or for these really early conference games, you know, for someone like, Sewell Ross State played played Howard Payne. You know, that's a really long drive between sure. the two spots, and so you're going to see them play close to Thanksgiving or close yeah, to Christmas absolutely. when it when it doesn't disrupt the schedules. But you know, if I were if I were a coach, I would want that early part of the season to you know maybe go some places you don't go, play some teams you're you're not likely you're you're not like not likely to see later in the season. Um, and give my give my team a chance to gel yeah. together because unless you know you're a top twenty five team or you know you're going to have a really strong program, you want to play well in the yeah. non conference games. Yep. But that's your chance to sort of experiment yeah. and come together. And it's a heck of a thing to lose a game on December first or November twentieth, and then at the end of the year when you're in a, in a tight race and you're you know every game counts, you end up lo- you end up missing the playoffs or getting a road game because you lost the game. You know, three months ago in the third game of the season, uh, you know, before Thanksgiving. Yeah, and then, and on the East Coast, it's funny because I've always thought on the East Coast that the the kicker to the whole thing and what was really screwing things up was the ECAC. And by saying that, I mean the ECAC has this rule where the teams basically have to take a two week break from playing basketball if they want to be qualified for ECAC postseason. At least that's how I remember it. If I'm incorrect, I apologize to anybody who might come at, down on me on Twitter after hearing that. But that's what I'm under the belief of. So I could see these conferences going, well, I'd love to schedule a game, one more game before Christmas. But I got you know, these schools want two weeks off and they want to play at a tournament over the holidays. And, well, that means I got to push into November. But when you look at Hope and they're playing Calvin on, on November 19th, you realize, well, they're not involved in the ECAC. So clearly other things are going on. Um, I certainly would love. And the other thing, too, is I know the Centennial Conference has gotten into this. You know, there was a, a, a call from the conferences saying, you know, from the coaches and such in the schools. Can we get back to double headers? We understand Bryn Mawr is a, is a hook on this whole thing, but can we try and get back to double headers at least? Um, you look at the MIA schedule. There's no double headers on a quick overview. You know, there. It, it's just a little, you know, bonkers. And who knows? We'll see what happens. the The calendar has not been friendly, and it may not be for a couple of years here before things maybe settle down. Uh, yet again. Um, other things around women's basketball, uh, obviously the, the preseason top 25 is rather fluid, but I, what really jumped out at me, Gordon, and you're a voter in this poll, is we had, if, um, if I can do a quick count in my head, seven teams who were not in the, pre, the final top 25 last year jump into the top 25 with Carthage making the biggest jump up to 12th. William Patterson, Trinity, Texas, FDU, Florham, Marymount, Rhodes, and George Fox also jumping in there. Um, you know, you always get a few. On the men's side, there were four, but you always get a few. But seven, that's a good chunk of teams jumping into that preseason poll. Yeah, I, I think what you have for top 25 voters, and you know, myself included on, on the women's side, and maybe you'll relate to it on the men's side, is when you have, when you have so little to go on, you yeah. know, preseason, you essentially have last year's results and your own subjective opinion of how how valid you think they are so whether the kids whether they have a lot of kids coming back whether you think it was a strong unit or just the right circumstances so what you tend to see is people will make judgments based on other factors that mm-hmm. they judge to be relevant so pre, pre 
program history is a big one. So George Fox is in the tournament, yeah. not because they had a great year last year, not because they have a lot returning, because they, they really don't. They have a couple of nice pieces, but their best player, Hannah Munger, uh, graduated. Yeah. But that's a program that, like Hope, uh, you know, like Messiah, like Amherst, people feel comfortable voting for because the names change, but the results generally don't. Well, they're two years um, removed from a 32-1 and one season, so... Right. The other thing you see is people will look back at the NCAA tournament with a little of distance now, and they'll say, okay, I'm looking for a team that maybe lost to somebody who had a deep run early in the tournament, and they find FDU Florham, who lost by one to Widener, who went to the Elite Eight. Yeah. Or they find Carthage, who lost to, I think it was the Whitewater or Stevens Point or whoever it was, and that team had a deep run. So they say, okay, well... You know, if the bracket had been a little different and Florham had had a different first or second round opponent, maybe they're in the Sweet 16 and they're they're far, they're farther up in the poll. So, in the absence of games played, yeah. you you look at which programs have been strong. What was you know where did how did teams perform in the NCAA tournament instead of where they finished, and what they have coming back. So, a team like Trinity who doesn't really hit either of those first two criteria has the conference player of the year coming back, has four or five starters. And and so, you know, if I'm judging that against teams that don't have those same criteria and aren't established programs with success over and over again, those are the teams I go for. I, I, I and On the women's side more than the men's side, things are more stable. So you know Hope is going to be good even if you don't know who's going to be on their team. You know Amherst is going to be good even though – you know, a week before the season started, they, were, had, they showed five players on their roster. You know, you know, Messiah is going to be good. You know, these programs are going to be good. So, people will will move towards those and gravitate towards those programs because there's not a, a good chance that most of those teams are going to embarrass you as a voter by going, you know, ten and fifteen. Yeah. No, and, and and trust me, there's all kinds of that. And you and I, well, you know, we, you get this packet of information essentially on each team that you get information for um, percentage of return points, percentage of return rebounds, uh, right. how many players are coming back from the team that started. You know, the players that started have, are coming back to the team, et cetera. And you you have to you know work your way through that, um, for lack of a better word, minutia. Some people take some of that data and, and love certain parts of it and some people love other parts of it i know i look at the percentage of points coming back i look at rebounding coming back and and stuff like that and go okay that gives me a good testament of what this team is but obviously doesn't tell me the whole story because there's bench guys coming back and then that's when you read into the secondary stuff and, and all but yeah it just it jumped out of me that seven teams jumped in there i'm not all that surprised by the seven per what they did last year except for maybe after you form um, but certainly good teams abound. Of course, you know you say that, and then you look at all the teams that got receiving votes, and you can kind of tell the the questions that are up in the air. I talked to Coach Huffman last week about this, Gordon, and, and I'd love to get your point on it. We always, in the last few years, decade or so, the women's basketball has been kind of dominated at the top by some of the usual suspects, um, Wash U, the Hopes, um, you know, so, some usual teams up there, the Amherst even, uh, that are always there, and then there's everybody else. It almost seems like that top tier has grown quite a bit in recent years, especially now. You know, DePaul is now into the equation much more. Granted, they won a title in 07, don't want to take away from that but anyway, but, you know, they're now in the equation every year. Wash U is certainly back there. Christopher Newport getting a lot of love this year, moving up to third. Obviously, they return a ton. Um, the WIAC schools are now really in play. St. Thomas is in play. Uh, the Nescax and Amherst are still over there, and you still have hope. It seems to me, and, and as a voter, you can maybe be better at this, that it's the top tier has gotten a lot deeper, and then behind them are now a lot of good teams that maybe that gap has completely gone away. I, I think that's right, Dave. And I, I think what's happened is while you do have you have individual programs that are that are excellent regardless of, of how good their conference is, right? Um, you know, and you you'll continue to have that because. 
coaches get players and they win and they right. you know they the schools have individual advantages and I maybe more so see, in women than in men you you see that I, a little I, bit I more think, in women yeah i think that's the case and i i think part of it is really good women's basketball teams beat really bad women's basketball teams by a ton and right. while you can have a, a a night where a really where a mediocre or a below average men's basketball team beats a really good one because the kids are on. That happens far far less frequently in women's basketball. So just the the the, the, the chance of those types of upsets is lower. But I I think to your point about the deepening of the top tier, I think what's happened is there's a couple of conferences that are a lot deeper now than they were f- five six years ago. Yeah. So. Um, you know, the NESCAC is a good example where 10 years ago the NESCAC was basically Bowdoin and everybody else. Yeah. Uh, and now, while Bowdoin is still a quality program, you've got Amherst, you've got Tufts, and you've got Williams. Yeah. Northwest Conference really 10 years ago was sort of Puget Sound and everybody else. Uh, and now you've got Whitman, you've got Lewis and Clark, you've got George Fox. Yeah. DCIW. Uh, has broadened at the top. You've got Illinois Wesleyan, you've got Carthage, uh, you know, you've, you've got other programs, you've got Wheaton, which is solid. And so I think as those, those conferences have broadened at the top, you know, the difference between Amherst and Tufts has been pretty small. So if you think Amherst can win the national title, which is a legitimate point of view, then it, it's hard to argue that Tufts can't do it too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you think the Northwest Conference is one of the best conferences in the country, which I, I think it is, then whoever's at the top of that conference, which tends, which this year might be Whitman, has to be considered a, a conference championship contender. So I think as you see the broadening of those conferences and the development of those conferences, and some conferences like the, the WIAC and the UAA have always been like that. They've always had two or three teams at the top yeah. uh, that are that are national title contenders. But as some of these other conferences have become deeper and, and broadened that. At, again, at the top, not necessarily all the way down at the bottom where there are still some weaker programs. Sure. The depth of teams that can win a national title has broadened as well. Um, so kind of with that loaded idea going into it, and obviously with the top 25 you know, kind of in front of us, um, who are the teams that really everybody should be keying on this season? I, I mean, obviously the national champs in DePaul, but are there anybody who may be sleeping under there or in the top 25 or getting lost in the in the headlines or something that you are at least going you know what I'm going to keep an eye on this squad yeah the two teams that I that I uh I like a lot out of the top 25 um you know one is Whitman who I mentioned before uh they return a lot of of a, a lot of talented players and they're the type of team um the, the well Sarah Anderick is probably their best individual player uh, Heather Johns is, is, you know, might be a close second or first, depending on on how you look at it. They're a very deep team with a lot of interchangeable parts. Uh, I, I I think the top team in the, in the Northwest Conference should always be considered, you know, a top 15 if not top 10 team. So I had Whitman uh, pretty high up in my poll, and you know they played St. Thomas at home in a close game. Um, that could look a lot like a, a, a game in the tournament, other than the fact that it'll never be played in, you know, in, at Whitman because of geographic <laughs> considerations are unlikely to be. Yeah, you're gonna have uh, a few things going their way that would get that right. to work. Yeah, and, and, and they won that game, so yeah. I, I think they're gonna. They're, I haven't looked at their conference, or their non-conference schedule too closely, but there's a good chance that they're gonna dip into the. You know the Biolas and the, specific, the Pacific Lights and the teams that you know sort of make you and, and my eyes gloss over. But in the early part of the season and in the later part, I, I think that's a team to keep an eye on. Another one that's that's a little off the radar just because the region they're from doesn't tend to produce a lot of national championship contenders is Ithaca. I watched them last year. Uh, I've watched them a handful of times over the years, and. Um, they have a style of play when they're good that's kind of hard to love because they win a lot of 41, 36 games, <laughs> uh, which you know with with a lot of thrilling you know, five foot jumpers. Yeah, and, and you know they're they're not they're they're not uh, you know they're not running the system. They're not scoring 170 points. They're grinding maybe, it maybe in a three week span. So you yeah. know <laughs> um, at, at, at the same time. Um, you know, their coach and their kids, uh, when I watch them play at Williams in a tough environment in a game that they probably should have been hosting if their gym wasn't being renovated, those are, I, yeah. I think, some really mentally tough and physically tough kids. And I think Ithaca, I came out of that after having watched that game that, that Williams won in overtime and said, 
wow, I, I really missed the boat on this Ithaca team. This Ithaca team was actually really good. And, you know, upstate New York, with the exception of Rochester, which is, you know, kind of upstate New York by geography, but plays the, in the UAA, right. hasn't really produced a national championship or, or uh, a team uh, able to have a deep tournament run. I don't know, since maybe all the way back when G.P. Grimacki was coaching at St. Lawrence, which is, you know, <laughs> almost a decade ago. Yeah, seriously. So, you know, so Ithaca's not going to have a lot of games in their conference schedule where you're going to go, ooh, tonight Ithaca's playing Elmira. <laughs> That's really going to tell me a lot about their NCAA tournament hopes. But I, I think that team's pretty good. Well, I'm certainly going to keep an eye. I, I, I'll have to admit, I would love to have been in, in the office when uh, the AD talks to both the men's and women's basketball coaches about how the gym will be unavailable for conference tournament and potentially NCAA tournament action. That that would have been a conversation I would love to have paid attention to. Um, yeah. I think it ended up hurting both teams uh, that deserved to make deep runs last year. Um, and quickly, before I get to the men, I want to get your, your take on uh, – you you certainly know my opinion on the on what has happened with the women's basketball committee over the last few years. Interesting move bringing Dave Martin in. We interviewed him last week. If anybody missed it uh, on a technically glitched show, um, and he didn't have a lot of answers as of now because he literally has just taken over as committee chair in the last month. Uh, of course, his first year on the committee. Period. First year on a rack. Uh, Dave Martin, former men's basketball committee chair, in case anybody missed it, um, and a- AD at, at Misericordia, I joked with him, former head coach at men's basketball, former interim women's basketball coach right, at Misericordia, yeah. who had an NCAA tournament run himself. Your take on what that means. He certainly wouldn't go into it. I dove into it myself, but from your vantage point of certainly being the women's guru, let's say, for lack of a better description for D3 Hoops, how do you take that decision that the guys like the Matt Donahoe's at, at Catholic who decided they didn't want the chairmanship, even though it was rightly theirs to take, and they hand it to Dave Martin? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, a, a really interesting dynamic there. I'm not really sure what to make at it from a coach's standpoint, other than the fact that you know I I I think that having talked to and heard from some of the from the women's coaches on the committees and, and not you know I, I can't speak specifically to all of them yeah I'm not sure that for some of the folks on the committee that they have a real depth of knowledge of kind of I think they're they're obviously excellent coaches and they know their region but when you get outside of their region I'm not sure they know it as well we, we, we had talked to one of the committee members and they had made the comment when we asked them off you know, off right. air. You know, why are why are Calvin and Hope lined up to play in the same in the same round week, two, in the same second yeah. weekend? And and the comment was sort of baffling, and that the person said, "I didn't realize they were in the same conference." That was all that, that, amazing. That that's like saying I didn't realize Duke and North Carolina were in the same conference, well, or I didn't realize yeah. that the Red Sox and the Yankees were in the same division. Oh, so, thanks for reminding me. I totally had forgotten. I think I probably wanted to forget it for obvious reasons. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, and, absolutely. And so, if you can if you can miss that and be someone who's coaching division three, and again, excellent coach. No, oh, absolutely. On, on 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 his or her program, I'll keep it generic. Yeah, no, no, I agree. But I agree with you. I yeah, the person is well respected. I, I yeah. The comment was that made so, it more so, out of the left field than ever. But let let's let's just assume for the moment that that person is not an aberration, and that yeah. there are other folks on the committee who may not be familiar with those things. You know, maybe maybe Dave will be able to bring that. And there are there are certainly people who. You know, people like Coach Egner at at, at Stevens Point and, and Coach Cairns at Milliken who, you know, get the whole national dynamic mm-hmm. of where these teams are from and who they play and and you know who they're you know who they should try and avoid in those those early round matchups. Maybe Dave will will bring uh will bring a little bit of that perspective. Um, you know, we we've talked in the past about how the the tournaments on the women's side four or five years ago were maybe a little more daring geographically. And the men's tend to be more geogra- more regional, so you would yeah. see teams that were close to each other yeah. play each other, and that sort of flipped in the it last totally years. Totally flipped. Now the women's teams, unless you know, except for the teams that are on an island like a Whitman, who's got to be flown yeah. somewhere, or whoever the Texas team is that's got to be flown somewhere, they've really become a lot more regional. So you don't see as many 
team from Virginia, a team from Pennsylvania, a team from Ohio, and a team right. from Wisconsin, all in the same, all in the same, you know, second weekend of the tournament. It'd be interesting to see if, if that, uh, you know, if that dynamic returns. You know, Dave was was very involved in the um, in, that in the men's side. Maybe, maybe that, maybe we see that start to come back on the women's side. Yeah, you you remind me of that fact, and 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 you're so right. And I think we we did see that, and it almost makes you wonder about the leadership that the women had in place. That coaches who are entering the national side of things are not getting a national perspective of things. Um, you know, Dave Martin was part of that group who really changed how the men were doing things, um, and we certainly respected him and everybody's work since then. Um, well, we respect their work, period. I shouldn't say it like we respected it, you know, all of a sudden. Um, but I, I'm certainly intrigued by that. Um, but let me flip on the men's side of things. Anything jumping out at you? I mean, we could we could talk in nauseam about everything going on in men and women. Um, but anything in the first week that's really jumped out at you on men? Obviously, we talked to um, uh, Dan Engelstad at, at Southern Vermont uh, earlier yeah. in the show. Big win over, over Williams, uh, though he flat out admitted – the letdown. I should point out, by the way, we didn't talk about the Hope women. How about the letdown? They had played uh, <laughs> North Central uh, the game before Calvin in a Grinnell style. Uh, I said a word I'm not allowed to say on the show anymore. Uh, system style. Uh, maybe I'll go bleep that out in uh, in editing here. Uh, system style programming uh, where they had to score out so much. But on the men's side of things, you know, big win there for Southern Vermont. Anything else jumping out at you uh, in the first week? Uh, I, I like you know, other side of the country, and and uh, you know they they reached a point maybe here to some extent where we we shouldn't have confetti and, and streamers out of the rafters every time they won. But Caltech started the season one and zero. How about <laughs> so, that? Uh, yeah, so I, I I started when I when I started they did, they're the getting in my top twenty five. They're getting in my top. Yeah. 25. <laughs> I, I started to write their first time over five hundred in many years, figuring that they had probably started zero and five, zero and seven, zero and eight. And actually, it's not that long ago they yeah. had a season where they started three and two. But um, <laughs> if, you know, so that's 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 so that that was a you know that was a, a nice surprise. Uh, you know, for if you're if you're a, if you're a fan of the underdog, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's anything other than co- uh, coincidence, but a lot of coaches hitting milestones early in the yeah. year. Uh, Palumbo at Guilford got his 300th win. Yep. Cassidy at Rowan got his 300th win. Barron at Quinn and Mercy got his 200th win. And Bill Brown at Whitburg got his 500th win. So, um, you know, again, I, I think that's that's totally coincidence. But if there's, uh, if there's a time of year when you can sort of enjoy those wins uh, yeah. and have a lot of time to build up to them, you know, for all of those programs, this is it. I remember when Strong broke the record, he had had a chance, Mike Strong for Scranton, when he broke the, the women's record held by, by Phil Kaler at the time, he had had a chance to break it at the end of the year, sort of in the middle of the tournament and, 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 and conference tournament and NCAA tournament run, and instead he broke it early the next year, and that almost, I think, gave the, the school like a full off-season to plan for the event. So, um, you know, I, I, that's an element of it. I've also enjoyed just looking at the looking at the uh, the games and saying, "Oh, all these games are regional now." So, yeah. for the know, most part, yeah. The SUNY Old Westbury, which should put an application to be an affiliate member of the Northwest Conference, <laughs> apparently because they're playing all their non-conference games. It's kind of fun to look at that and go, "Oh, SUNY Old Westbury versus Lewis and Clark. That's a regional game." You know? yeah. so, it's funny. Uh, it, as opposed, we haven't had a conference. Saying, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, as opposed to saying, gee, is the fact that did SUNY Old Westbury have to make a decision about either giving their kids a really interesting opportunity and a chance to play basketball in a place probably most of them have never been versus getting wins that are going to help them in the regional rankings. They can actually do both this year, and that's that's kind of cool. Well, hey, what well, was it? Dallas played in the NEAC, uh, technically, right. <laughs> uh, and then we got that right. school out in California who's playing in the GSAC or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, Finlandia, yeah, yeah, Finlandia from Michigan. Well, yeah. no, there's, isn't there, wasn't there a, a California school? It could be. A St. Mary's of California or something? South is very relative. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the, as a, as, of- yeah, as a result, the GSAC got the the uh, the rights to be in a, in multi-regions um, <laughs> for next year. By the way, uh, uh, you, Gore, Pat, and I have not talked about the fact that we could technically go through the schedules and mark all the games regional. Um, yeah, it makes, well, it makes that, that, uh, <laughs> that, that makes that point. That, uh, you know, administrative point uh, a lot easier. For yeah. Us. So I, you know, I, I I like that. This is a this is the time of year. Um, 
you know, I, candidly, I don't get to do as much of it as I'd like because, you know, you and I are usually busy on Saturdays covering mm. football in some fashion. Saturdays. But this is a time <laughs> of year if you're, if you're a fan of basketball. And, you know, last weekend I lived 10 minutes from, uh, from Swarthmore. And if I had had the opportunity to, you know, if I, did, if I wasn't, you know, busy doing, doing football, I could have gone and seen Oglethorpe play Swarthmore. So yeah. it's a chance to watch those types of programs that, you know, I'm not getting to Atlanta again anytime soon, or uh, you know those, those types of pro, those types of teams. Yeah. Illinois Wesleyan played at Bolt, uh, played at John Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. So, so kicking myself, I couldn't go to that game. So the, the, this time of year, that's that's the fun thing is to see matchups. You know, barring really deep NCAA tournament runs or really strange bracketing. You're not going to see SUNY Old Westbury play Whitman in men's no. basketball again. So if you're around those games and, and you get a chance and you see a name on the schedule and you go, oh, go yeah, I don't it. think that team's at my conference, it, it, it's a chance to go watch different styles of basketball play each other in, uh, you know, it, it, at, a, at a time of year when, um, you know, when, when things are, I think, a little more, a little more relaxed and teams yeah. are still trying to find their their. Uh, their uh, they're you know to gel together. Well, you, Pat, and I, and some others. I don't know who else. You know, keep a tab of of the the schools we've seen, the facilities we've seen a game in, and even you know, obviously the sports that they've been playing in. And you know, for us, it'd be like, oh wait, I can go see who. Um, <laughs> and I'm kicking myself I didn't get a chance to see Hopkins Illinois Wesleyan. But then again, on you know, I I was on hand at an, a women's Division three ice hockey game, a Division three football game, a, a ECAC women's soccer game. I announced two basketball games. All this this is all last weekend. While on top of making sure another ice hockey game was okay, a couple other basketball games were okay. You know, it, it was one of those weekends where I went, oh, yeah, Hopkins, Illinois, Wesleyan. Well, if, if they could play at midnight, uh, right. I'll be there. <laughs> um, otherwise, they, I got no chance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, football takes up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday um, for the most part. Um, well, hey, by the way, uh, Randolph Macon's doing its best impression of 2012-2013. Uh, they were the best 0-3 team to uh, start the season last year, uh, make the NCAA tournament, make an awesome run in the tournament before I think uh, Travel Weary got the best of them uh, at Amherst. Uh, of course, uh, they start 1-2. and two. That's what's jumping out at me, losing to Scranton on the road and then Christopher Newport. But uh, you never can count out the uh, the Yellow Jackets. By the way, it's it's always strange to look at a preseason top 25 and see a team that's 21-10, and 10, ranked number 16. Um <laughs> But it's kind of like Franklin in football with three losses. We're in the top 25. Same mentality. Uh, sometimes the schedule doesn't jump out at you. Any other quick things before I, I ask you uh, quickly about the weekend? No, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I'm looking looking forward to uh, you know looking forward to the season. Really looking forward to this weekend. And yeah, you're, you're, uh, you've done a you know, a, I'll say what's probably awkward for you to say personally, but you've done a really great job uh, as, as tournament director bringing together. Um, you know, teams from all over the country who are really high quality, and uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, you know crossing a number of teams off my list that I haven't seen, like Laverne men's basketball. There you go. Also, oh, you already that, saw Laverne. You're in D, you're in Vegas, weren't you? Or, uh, or were you not there that year? That was the women's basketball team. So this will be the men. I so, thought we uh, had the men's team there when they nearly knocked off Transylvania. Ah. Uh, Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, so uh, yeah, because so I was well, I bumming I that I can't. Yeah, list, I was gonna say I was bumming I couldn't check them off. It, it, it's, uh, <laughs> at, at least I won't have to, uh, you know, take a four-hour almost cross-country <laughs> flight to watch them play. So uh, <laughs> this is true. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the uh, uh, to the D3 Hoops Classic, which will be a mix of, of Northwest Conference teams. It's basically the Northwest Conference WIAC Challenge. So yeah. um, you know, this is a time of year where. Either if you can get to them because the teams are coming to you when they're playing weird matchups, or you can go on a weekend and see four or five teams you haven't haven't seen before. This is a this is a time of year to do that, and I uh, I always look forward to that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think Friday will certainly warm you up to uh, Vegas when we have six games in two, uh, on two different days in Vegas. Right. Uh, we'll have <laughs> five games on, on Friday uh, for you. Um, of course, um, 
and, and I've already gotten warning from one coach at Trinity, Texas, that uh, the coaching stinks there. Um, our good friend Pat Cumming already falling on his own sword. Um, but uh, certainly looking forward to having you down there at, at the games. And, and again, I encourage anybody who can show up to these games uh, or even watch them online. There's going to be some really good basketball against and some teams I think that are unsung. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and having you there finally. I know last year you couldn't make it. Again, I don't think you need to go to your, your other job on Saturday. I give you permission. If you need me to write a slip, I will do so. Uh, to Matt Levy at, at, at Delaware Valley, I am more than happy to give you permission to take Saturday off and join us at the well, Classic. Maybe, maybe, one, maybe one of these years Coach Casey Stitzel will bring his men's team down. And uh, <laughs> uh, Casey's an assistant athletic director at Delaware Valley College, and Jim Clements, who's the head football coach, is not. So maybe that's, maybe that's the pathway there. <laughs> there you go. Smart man. Well, hey, Gordon, thanks so much for joining me here on this special taped uh, episode of Hoops. Well, I certainly appreciate you taking all this time. We certainly talked a good long chunk here. Um, a- any final thoughts you want to share with those tuning in? Nope. In Baltimore. I or like it. Or Owings Mills. I Owings Mills. Mills. I'll be at the wrong place. Well, yeah. you'll be in Baltimore County. Just just keep that in mind. All right, well, Gordon. I, I look forward to seeing you there. Absolutely. Well, take care of yourself. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll talk soon. Gordon Mann joining us here on the Hoopsville Hotline. Uh, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, wrap up the show, kind of give you another preview of the Hoopsville Classic and, and all there is involved in that. But, of course, look ahead at just what we can expect in the next couple of weeks anyway. Uh, you are listening to Hoopsville, presented by D3Hoops.com, the National Association of Basketball Coaches. Uh, again, Twitter, at D3Hoopsville, or hashtag Hoopsville, Facebook.com slash Hoopsville, and, of course, Hoopsville at D3Hoops.com. We'll be back right after this.